He was such a precocious talent, Footscray entrusted Ted Witten's number three Guernsey with him at the age of 16. He was gone from the AFL at 27, but not before he notched 200 games with two clubs. More recently, a tragic turn of events changed his life forever. Welcome, Alan Stoneham. Thanks, Mike. 16 and playing AFL football. Yeah, it's at, at the time in the 70s. Tough, wasn't uh, it? Oh, yeah. Um, physical, um, mental, everything. But it was a you wouldn't change it for the world. It was fantastic. What are your memories? Yeah. I know it was a game against North Melbourne. Did you start on the ground? Yeah, I started on the ground. Um, on whom? Uh, I think I started on Gary Cowton. Yeah. And I uh, was lucky enough to uh, get a, a kick early. and. Um, uh, Which resulted in a goal? Yeah, it was my first kick in, yeah. in league footy. So first kick, a goal. Technically second, he ran over the mark, so they pulled me closer and I had another kick and slotted it through. What was it like? I mean, it's eerie to think that a kid of 16... I know Tim Watson's a great mate, he wasn't played at 15, but yep. it is very rare. Were yeah, you scared? I, I mean, were you...? I'd played in the VFA the year before at yeah. Sunshine, so... Yeah. Um, physical intim in intimidation when you play against uh, Port Melbourne and mm. Danny and, <clears throat> and Preston uh, and I like it. Uh, you know, I'd go to school with black eyes and broken noses at, uh, you know, the year before, so... I was hoping it might have been a bit softer, but it was never, never the case. But, uh, um, uh, no, I, I was re really, really looking forward to it. Mm. So it's excitement rather than apprehension. Oh, it's everyone's dream yeah, to, to yeah. play league footy. You grew up in that most famous of Bulldog nurseries at the Braybrook Football Club. Yeah. It was, so I played at Sunshine, lived at Braybrook. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, when you got to the Doggies, Bobby Rose was the coach. Yep. He gave you your first game. Yep. Do you remember uh, him? Did he tell you directly or...? He came to me on the on the Wednesday night. Um, I played on the, uh, the the previous Sunday against Preston. I played on Laurie Hill, uh, mm -hmm. uh, a great Collingwood player, a Liston uh, medalist. And um, uh, then the, the following week um, went went in straight into the into the into the senior side of Footscray. From Sunshine in the VFA <laughs> into an AFL into the arena. A, into the yeah. AFL, yeah, and uh, trained with them on a couple of occasions and yeah. straight into the team. And they, look, I, I'm sure, and I could understand that there might have been a few players that... You know that, don't you? Oh, yeah. That yeah. they thought, you know, what's going on here? And why? What's this blondie-haired kid yeah. coming, yeah, taking right. our spot? He's yeah. been gifted a game and... Uh, and there, I, was, I wasn't guaranteed any games um, or anything of that nature to, to come and play with Footscray. Um, but the fact that I come from... You know, I was 16, lived in, in Braybrook, uh, so, you know, the home of, uh, of the great Ted Whitten. Yep. Um, it all, a lot of synergy. And uh, at that time, probably was a good promotional tool for Footscray Football Club. How did you feel? <coughs> Tell me the origin of you getting EJ's number three jumper. Well, they mentioned it uh, the week before. Well, if you come. And this was the time, time of the year when uh, clearances closed on the 30th of June. Correct, yeah. yeah. And uh, I had to, uh, if you come this week, uh, we'll give you Ted's jumper. That oh, was the incentive, yeah. and I wore Ted's jumper as a kid, like all Footscray yeah, supporters. Yeah. Um, you know, I used to go week in, week out with my with my nan to the footy, and um, adored Footscray. Um, mm -hmm. Not a lot of success. Used to go home and kick the ball around the backyard after a game and cry because we lost. Yeah. <laughs> but there wasn't a lot of wins. Yeah. But uh, Ted was Ted was Ted, um, and I had his number on my back as a kid. So the the, the number three jumper swayed you, did it? Well, yeah, that was a swinger. Um, was they, there any money involved? Oh couple hundred bucks. Big Is deal. that all? Yeah. yeah. There wasn't a, a Gladstone bag full of cash. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't have it. Footscray didn't have the cash. <laughs> right. you know, that was Richmond and all those clubs. But no, there was no money. Um, a couple hundred dollars and that was that was it. So you ran out on the ground, this kid amongst men. Yeah. Did any of the North boys try to rough you up? No, not really. I, I lost my legs. I couldn't, you couldn't feel your feet at first. You just thought, wow, what's, uh, you know, where am I? What am I doing? That jumper that you wore is uh, in the museum at yep. Witten Oval, isn't it? It's, it? It is, as I understand it, is the number three Guernsey that Ted wore. It wasn't, a, you didn't get a new number three, no, it was no. the same one. <clears throat> well, things were tight at the club at that time. <laughs> <laughs> there was cost savings. Um, Joey, um, Joey uh, Little, I think, well, he, he was a property steward. Yep. And, and he was a mean property steward in those days. He'd, to um, to get anything, socks, jocks, you, you just didn't get. He used to cut PK Chewies in half, <laughs> and that's that's serious. Oh, that, you're well, telling I'm, me that's I'm, true. I'm, that's it? true. He yeah, cut yeah. PK Chewies in half. Um, so my jumper, uh, uh, as as he gave it to me on the Wednesday night, um, he said, "Look, this was Ted's last jumper, and it was like putting on a yep, sheet. Yeah, it was yep, huge because yep. he was a big man. So he took it home, sewed it up, and uh, cut it. So his wife 
cut it and sew it. And, uh, Is that right? And there it was on the um, next set. You know, in this era, I mean, Ted Whitten's jumper would sell for 50 grand hmm. if it was authenticated and, yeah, and, and the original. So it's brought nothing and been given to you. Well, it, it was sold for it, it, at uh, Lesky's many years ago. Was uh, it really? It's the highest price that they've ever Is received. Is that right? Was yeah. it your jumper? Yeah. What did you sell it for? $17,500. And you, it, did you need the money? We lost we lost a business and uh, That house. was in the GFC? Yeah, no, no. This is, uh, this is uh, ooh, eight, nine years ago. Yeah. We, we lost a business, lost houses and, you know, I had two boys at private school mm -hmm. um, and I, <clears throat> it was bad enough from disrupting and uh, to move and all sorts of things and we started again because we were employed by the business so yep. Julie didn't have a job, I didn't have a job and got fees to pay and um, Kevin Bartlett asked the question one day whether I had the jumper or you know that would be valuable and um, never considered it before mm. and I thought God, I've got to think about this. Um, it's in a drawer. I, I don't have any memorabilia displayed at home. Uh, I never have. Uh, it's gaining dust in a drawer. It's, uh, if, if it's real value to me, uh, I know I, have, well, I wore the jumper. Friends, everyone else know I had number three. Um, let someone enjoy it. And uh, Lesky uh, auctioned it. And, and it was bought by someone at the football club and it's now on display at their, at their museum. Where it's okay. a, that's where it should be. Eight years with the Bulldogs. Not a lot of success. Uh, two finals, both losses. Yep. What was wrong with the doggies at the time, do you think? Uh, what was the missing ingredient? I think direction. We, we weren't... Uh, we had some great players, um, but we, we weren't instructed to, uh, to play as a team. There were some great individuals, mm. um, and um, a team of individuals will never beat a great team, you know, and that's... Mm. You know, that just holds strong and fast forever. Uh, and we, we just didn't have a great team plan. And uh, there was a couple of years that we did. Gog and Billy brought a, a good structure to the club and mm. um, uh, we had some minor success and played in the finals with him and uh, I think we could have gone places. But unfortunately, coaches and administration at Footscray didn't, <laughs> didn't, yeah, didn't last right. long together. And, you know, well, Billy had an acrimonious relationship with oh, the administration, much, didn't very he? Very much so. Yeah. Um, but uh, he quick he left and um, you know went to Geelong and had some success there. Mm. But, but Billy was he was a good coach at Footscray. Did you you came in with this massive fanfare? You know the good looking young kid at sixteen playing AFL in in EJ's number. Yeah. Did you did you think you achieved the level of success that you would have thought you might have done when you set out? No, no. Um, Looking back, at hindsight's a wonderful thing. You can, you know, it's, it's easy to look back or crystal ball and say, "I wish I did." I, I would have liked to have um, probably played under Shooty as a coach as Shooty was as a kid. What um, demand more of you? More of me taught me a lot about uh, footy, or for the sake of the exercise, Goggin. He looked at me as a player and uh, knew, looked at my shortcomings. You know, you're not quick, um, so if you're not quick. Uh, Dennis Marshall wasn't quick, mm. but he never he never fumbled the ball. So you've got to pick up some tricks that you'll be a one-touch player. And Billy taught me that. So you've played 200 games of AFL footy, yeah. though. you played eight years at the Bulldogs. Yeah. What led then to your transfer to Essendon? Um, I, at that time, I'd suffered a, a fairly bad back injury. And uh, with backs, it uh, causes trouble to your legs. And um, I'd pinched a a sciatic nerve and it was like a constant hamstring, you know, when you're not overly quick and you've got a constant mm, hamstring, mm. it was a struggle. And um, my form had uh, sort of fallen off a little bit and uh, um, with that, uh, Footscray had, uh, or Charlie, Charlie Sutton had approached a couple of clubs to, to sell me. Mm. And uh, Were you aware of that? I found out through Don McKenzie, who mm. was coach at the time, yep. because uh, he asked me over for dinner and said, look, the club want to sell you. Like they've sold most players over the years mm. um, to balance the books. Uh, if you want to go, you can go. I've told the club I don't want you to go, um, and I think that'll cost me my job. Um, it's up to you. And I, I thought if the fellow had stuck his neck out for me, yep. <clears throat> I'd have to stay till the end of the season. But I did make a decision that uh, I'd see out the season and I'd leave. And I'm not sure where I'm going. Um, I found out pretty quickly because people were then coming to my, you know, knocking on my door saying, mm. look, they've, you know, they've, uh, they've offered us up to you, would you come and play for us? And so it was Collingwood and, uh, and Essendon. 
Collingwood Nestor. Yeah. And why did you pick the Bombers? Um, Mum didn't like Collingwood. <laughs> <laughs> Either what you love them does. or you hate them. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So yeah. Um, it, uh, it fell into place. Okay. It looked more than comfortable. It was just an interesting change to walk into a club where it, you didn't feel that there was no administrative turmoil. Mm. And, and unfortunately, the sad part about uh, the doggies in those days is that year in, year out, um, financially, you know, there was a new general manager, you know, two or three every second yep. year. It was yep. an amazing time. Uh, four years with Essendon? Yep. Enjoyed that? Time. Oh, I love it. You, you, I often wonder whether you see yourself, whether the heart is at uh, the Western Oval or at Windy Hill for you. I, I, I suppose I support the Bombers now where I finished. Um, mm. um, still live in Essendon, um, so it's, uh, I suppose it's where you end. Um, and not, not, not bitter about the fact that I, that I left Footscray, I love the club. Um, mm. And I love, I still catch up with a few mates um, uh, for, for breakfast, uh, Ross Abbey, Stephen Power and Peter mm. Welsh, you know, on once or twice a month. It's, uh, it's at, at, and that's at Footscray, at the Pound, it's great. What was the high point of, uh, of your footy career? 13 seasons? Yep. 200 games, yeah. two clubs. So is there one? Is there a moment or a, a period in, in your footy life that stands out? I, I think you, you're playing your first games are always a highlight. Um, playing finals uh, was fantastic. Uh, unfortunately, there wasn't enough of them, and it was always at Waverley. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, and two at Essendon, and we lost. We lost every one. So, so yeah. geez, I was, you know, I was, I was a lucky charm for both <laughs> clubs, wasn't I? Um, so you're not from four in finals. Yeah, yeah. not from four from finals. So it's uh, very disappointing. You know, that's in that respect, it's disappointing. Because I remember Bobby Rose asked all players to to write something and put it in in your wallet. Uh, but I want to see what it is, um, what you want. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I I wanted to carry a premiership cup around the MCG, and that was that was my dream. And that would have been Bobby was your coach in your first year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. And uh, that was my dream. Um, and you know, the last game I ever played, I carried a Premiership Cup around the MCG. In the seconds? In the seconds, yeah. in 83. 83, so okay. So it wasn't quite seniors, but that, uh, that little note could be taken out of my wallet and uh, I could tick that box and say, yeah. well, I did do it. You did do it. But I, and I didn't write a, set, a reserves cup. No, no. Um, it was it just was four cup. hours earlier than you would have liked. <laughs> uh, you had Kevin Sheedy as your coach one year under Barry Davis yep. and then Kevin Sheedy. What yep. are your memories of Sheeds? Well, he didn't. He, he didn't like teachers. Didn't like professionals. Um, he, he wanted his working class man. You know, mm. as Tommy used to say, Kevin, you're you're a plumber. Yep. You know, yep. don't try to finesse. And and that that was Sheeds' philosophy. He was a, he was pretty hard and tough. To to come to training with a suit on and uh, jump out of a you know a beat up old Merc. But, and, Get a Merc, did you? Yeah, you know, every, you know, you just do those sort of things. Wouldn't oh, be too many Mercs in, in uh, Braybrook, would no, there? No, there wasn't many, but I drove a little uh, MGB too. Uh, oh, that's right. And Shudes didn't that. like that either. Yeah. You know, so it's, uh, you're uh, a trendy young man, weren't you? You ought to do your best, Mike. You know, <laughs> you're a Western Suburbs boy. You know, I am. You make every, every, every you know, yes, every I'm post proud of it. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. yeah. What What was his view of your game? Did he try to change the well, way you played? Well, he did, um, and I knew that I had to change to play under him. You had to do certain things, and my job was, uh, I, I was his first tagger. Were you really? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I'd have to sit on guys and cut them out. Mm. And look, you had uh, and Dakes, um, Johnson, all those blokes, and I always did good jobs on them. Mm. But I remember my last game uh, at North Melbourne, ironic, my first game at North Melbourne, last game at North Melbourne, was on Shimmer. And um, too quick. Mm. You know, anyone with pace was going to kill me um, because I wasn't quick. Because Dakes wasn't quick, was he? he was just Not, clever. Yeah, and I played Not on Bartlett clever, yeah. for Sheedy and did a good job on yep. him because, yep. um, yeah, but in, in saying that, he, I had another chance on Bartlett and uh, he said, Not today. And, uh, <laughs> and he whacked me too. Did he? Yeah, Kevin yeah, Bartlett Kevin, whacked you? Yeah, no, Did he really? Because Kevin will tell the story that when he hit Bruce Nan Curvis, that was the only time in his yeah, life he's raised yeah, his hand in yeah. anger. Yeah. A backhander, when I, yeah. you know, and, and you don't, you're not expecting it. 1983, which ended up being your last year, mm. it was a famous incident, a notorious incident at uh, Princess Park. Um, Dipper actually smashed your face in, didn't he? Not yeah. to put too fine a point on it. No, it, uh, it, was, um, it was a fairly heavy collision. Elbow? Forearm. Forearm. Mm. Ball in, roughly in the vicinity? Well, close. Close. It was, at, <laughs> it, it was at my feet. Actually, yeah. Glenn Hawker handballed the ball and it yeah. never quite got to me. Mm -hmm. So as I was bending over, um, Dipper bent over at the same time with a forearm. And 
And then I, I woke up with uh, one of the trainers or the doctors with their fingers down their throat, uh, pulling out the, a mouth guard. Wow. So, to... so your nose was broken and your cheekbone was broken? Yeah. My memory says that you actually reappeared that day, is that right? Well, you know, I come back on after half time. And that, was, that was just on the half, half time siren. Um, immediately That's after... you on the ground there? Yeah. And there's a f the horde of Eston blokes heading for number nine, the and Robert de Peter I think the first bloke to, to, uh, to, to lay whatever it was on him was, uh, was Merv. Merv Nagel? Yeah. Mm. Angry young man, Merv. Yeah, he could be, and a very good player, wasn't he? Fantastic player. Did you complete the game? Yeah. With a broken nose and mm. a depressed fracture of the cheekbone? Yeah. And the next week? Played the next week against, I think it was against Geelong or Melbourne, yeah. Did Dipper get rubbed out for that? Got five. Got five. Mm. He also got something else uh, in the return match, did he not? It was yeah. a bloke called Cameron Clayton playing yeah. for Essendon. Yeah, Rattler. That squared up. Yeah, he squared up at, uh, at Windy Hill. So. He got him, didn't he? Oh, yeah. Uh, and he, I don't think he got reported for that either. They missed it. Yeah. But Dipper, they Dipper, might have thought Dipper was incredible anyway. Well, that's right. So there's, yeah, that, that just squares the ledger. Did you have a problem with Dipper post that incident? Nah, I had a beer with him that night. He was that so night? Hard. Yeah, well, you did in those days. That's, uh, that was football. Um, uh, occupational hazard. You know, you just... And you, you move on. After the break, the event that turned your world on its head. How do you feel watching your footy club, your second club, Essendon, not necessarily disintegrate, but endure the, the problems that they've had over the past 18 months? Uh, like, like most of the players, we're disappointed. Um, disappointed in whom? Well, disappointed in the processes that were put in place. At Essendon? Yes. And the governance? No governance. OK. Now, if it was in any other industry, um, people would be asked to clear their desk and move on. Well, they were, weren't they? Well, some, not yeah. all. So who, who's to blame? Well, it's it, it, no point pointing the finger, but I, I think that... Uh, 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 I think the football department needed to be needed to be looked at totally. And that's right from the top. Do you feel for the players? Oh, enormously. Mm. You know, um, as uh, as being close with uh, Tim Watson being one of my best mates and mm. has been for many years. Mm. Job's like a, a son. You know, he spent hours and hours and hours as a, when he was growing up. Um, my heart bled for him mm. um, because of the way it's turned out and people pointing fingers but they, these these players were instructed to do what they were told mm. and um, I wonder I wonder as a parent how I'd feel about my son being told mm. to do exactly what they did. Yeah. Talking about life as a parent and you've got two boys yep. one of whom is incarcerated at the moment yep. uh, having murdered his, his girlfriend. Yep. That's the tragic turn of events I talked about before. Yeah. How heavily... I, mean, I can't imagine how heavily that's weighed on you in the last two years. No, it, uh, it, it's life-changing. Mm. We'll never be the same. Mm. Never. So James is in um, Port, Port Phillip? Yeah. 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 And he's, uh, he's now getting uh, counselling. Um, we're coming to an understanding of where his mind was at the time. We had him uh, in the mental health system, which I'd heard was poor, but never realised how poor it was. So there's a psychiatric condition? Oh, mm. most definitely. Mm. So before this this turn of events, yep. um, were, you, were you aware that there was an issue with him? He tried to take his own life on a number of occasions. Mm. And, uh, and that was a shock in itself. Mm. You know, and, and being at home with him um, and my other son Morgan, we were all, and, and Julie, we, we, lived, we lived on the edge. Mm. If a door had opened, uh, who's that? James, is, are you there? What are you doing? Um, mm. We had occasions where he was on the cliff at Anglesey in places. Wow. He's your adopted son? Yep. Mm. Of Sri and, Lankan descent, yeah, is that? Yeah, and, and that... Uh, he's our son. Yeah, I, I wasn't I, I understand just it. making reason, a distinction. The reason I make point of that, because uh, when, it, when it occurred, it, it, there was a lot of emphasis on adopted son. Mm. You know, mm. we, we had ten years on the IVF program. Mm. Uh, and that was that was an enduring process, and we desperately wanted children, and we had the opportunity, not to say this was our second choice, but we'd always had our name down just in case. We couldn't have kids, mm. um, and we could not have been more happy to to go on anywhere in the world to to, to become a family. Yep. 
So we spent seven weeks in Sri Lanka after the allocation took place. It was a wonderful experience. Um, and, uh, you know, we, he's still our joy, one, of the, one of the two joys of our lives. Mm. This is painful, I know, but can you take me to the day when you heard the fateful news that James had taken his former girlfriend's life? Yeah, it, it was a dream, an, an absolute nightmare. Were, were you were, home? Were, we were out at dinner and had a couple of missed calls from James and um, uh, got home and, and, uh, and, and heard the news and Julie... What, from whom? Uh, Who? From, from one, of, one of his mates um, that uh, explained what had happened and... Um, uh, so we went straight to the police station at Mooney Ponds and, uh, oh, you know, it, uh, it's you... Because it, I know you, I've known you since you were a kid, yeah. I can't imagine you in that situation. Oh, look, I... To think that your boy is there and he's been charged with murder. Never been in trouble in his life. Never got detention at school. You know, extraordinary. Uh, nothing has ever happened before in his life and all of a sudden this. And, uh, well, we knew... He was, he was seeing a counsellor, that he saw his counsellor that day. For all intents and purposes, everything was fine. But he, he was diagnosed by another gentleman sometime later after the court uh, that he had a psychotic episode. But you knew he had a problem, didn't you? Oh, we, that's why he was, at mm. a, he was having mm. counsel. We had no idea uh, what was going on at that time. No idea meaning he was, he was, he was harming himself. He was still talking about taking his own life and that was it. So Adriana yeah. was his former girlfriend, yeah. and I know you've told me this before. Yeah, she was like how close you were to her. And sorry, she was like a daughter. Mm. And you, we miss her every day. Have you spoken to her parents? I can't. Um, we were asked not to. Uh, the father, Joe, is a, is, a, is a... They're both wonderful people. Joe rang me that night at the police station and uh, he asked me what, what had happened and uh, at that time I still wasn't certain of it, exactly, you know, where, we're, where we were at and what it... Yeah. You know, what the situation was. And I said, Joe, can I ring you back? Uh, I've never rang him back. You can't? I can't. He got 19 years, did he not? With the non-parole period of 14 and a half, is that right? Yeah, and, uh, yeah thereabouts and time spent. Mm. And he's been in two years. And so you see him regularly? I see him as much as I can. Yeah. Speak to him twice a day. Yeah. Um, he rings me. I love my boy. Mm. He knows he's, uh, he's got some, some serious uh, time to do. Mm. Um, but he's going to make the most of it. And that's what he's doing at the moment. You've got a lot of friends in footy. Oh. And, and a lot of them I know firsthand have been very supportive of it. Is there anyone, anyone that you've been disappointed in with since... Oh. Since this occurred, some people don't ring or haven't rung, um, and that's disappointing. You know, there's no no no, <laughs> no one in particular, but some people have a fear and they don't know what to say. Like I have no idea what to say, mm. um, and I wouldn't know what to say. It's like it's, this is like a double death. Yeah. Because yeah. you know we couldn't grieve Adri, you know, who who we dearly love and still love. Think mm. about every day. Mm. So. There can never be a winner out of this. Do you think that you'll ever be able to uh, confront Adriana's parents? I don't know. I'd like to, but uh, you know, in the course of time, maybe that'll happen. Has, has, have they tried to make any contact? No, no, and, and I can understand that. You know, gee, it, we, two weeks ago was Mother's Day, and some days are the day that we go and visit James, and they're, they're a hard day for all of us. They're mm. a hard day for Julie. Julie's in a, a shocking state at that time. Mm. Um, because it's confronting. Going to prison is an awful thing. Mm. Um, but we go and see our boy because we love him. Um, and his brother Morgan comes out with us and, uh, uh, and there's a number of his friends who, who, who he really cherishes uh, their, their visits as well and, and aunties. Um, but some, that day is a tough day and this is Mother's Day. Mm. And I, I, I knew that there was, there was something seriously wrong. And um, Julie just... Said, how's, mm, how does how does Adrian's parents feel today? Mm, yeah, her mum, mm. Mother's Day. As you said, it's um, it's just victims both sides of the, oh, of the family. Exactly, you know, and uh, it's not as if you want simply, you know, that's, that's the last thing you want. We're, we're, there's no winners in this. We're no, all victims. No. Do you do you have counselling? 
Yeah. 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 It, it's working? I need it. Mm. So after the initial impact, that, which none of us who haven't been through it can comprehend, what's been the lowest point since? I mean, how did it feel sitting in court and hearing oh. that your boy has been sentenced to the best part of 20 years in jail? Uh, it's devastating. You know, um, and th that he that he actually pleaded. He, did, he didn't what want. What do you to mean he pleaded? What do you mean? He pleaded guilty. He plea He made a plea. It didn't go. To, it didn't go to trial. Mm. Um, he didn't want to put us and their family through any more pain. Um, and that was hard. Mm. Very hard because uh, a lot of things would have come out. And about his, you know, his state of mind and mm. what he, what he thought he was doing at the time, and how he wanted to kill himself. But he said, "I just don't want to do that to, to the people I love," and that mm. included every, that was everyone. How the mother? That's so yeah. we don't know we're males, right? The, the bond between mother and son. No, strong. We, Jules is Jules, It's her boy. Mm. Always will be. How did she feel about you? You, you, you spoke to her about coming on here and talking very, about very this. Very, very nervous. Mm. Because this is, it's, hard, it's, it's a difficult subject mm. and um, it, look, I, I don't know how it's going how it's going to, what people will think about it. And I'm not here for sympathy. No. Or, um, it just, the, the circumstances change your life in one second. And it's not to say be ready for it because I hope it never happens to anyone else. Mm. I, I wouldn't wish this upon you know, your, your, your worst enemy. It's, uh, it happens, um, and it happens to a lot of people. Man, I admire your courage. I, I've always liked you. I admire your willingness to talk about a subject that the rest of us can't even envisage about the, uh, the impact it would have on you. Um, I hope that the experience will put a bit more light on, on, on what happened, uh, and that we'll have a better understanding of it, and uh, just good luck for the future, mate. Appreciate it, Mike. Thanks for your time.